how to paint a kingfisher's beak in watercolour. That's what I'm going to show you today, so let's get the bushes wet shall we, and let's get started. And when you're working on something like a kingfisher's beak, there's a lot of detail involved isn't there, there really is. The first thing I wanted to do on this is get the orange on the beak, which I've already done as you can see. And that's just a mixture of poppy and sunflower, I know. These are Regina's watercolour paints, so completely different names, ones I'm not normally used to. So using a fine sized or zero brush, work on the middle of the beak first of all. Try and think about the, the structure of the beak. So divide those two halves of the beak first. Then you can start to gradually fill in each half as you go along. But you can see from the reference photograph all the markings within this beak. So even though we've got two halves, they're not completely flat are they? You find that the top half has got more shape to it than the bottom half of the beak. That's because obviously it's really dark underneath that beak, so you can't really see much on the underside. But on the top part of the beak you can see quite a few depressions here and there as well. So I'm trying to replicate this, so first of all I'm starting off with a lighter wash to begin with, just to make sure I don't go too dark too soon. And also make sure that your brush isn't overloaded as well. Because if it's overloaded you find that your lines will appear far too thick. So what I do, I tend to load it first of all in some paint, in this case black as you can see. I roll the brushes to pull it away from the mixing palette and tap it a couple of times onto some kitchen roll before I go to the painting. Now please support my channel by clicking on the subscribe button down below and also that like button as well. At least by doing that, when I put another video on here on YouTube for you to watch, there's a good chance that you shouldn't miss it. I'm going to add these marks in a little bit darker now because I want to make sure I know where they are. I'm going to blend this as well by lightly going over the top of that with a damp clean brush, not soaking wet, just damp, just to soften that black down. And you can see by doing this, the black isn't really dark now is it on the top parts of the beak, it's more of a mid-tone. And when this is dry I can then build on the top of that with some more details thereafter. But I'm always fine tuning it all the time kind of tweaking it back and forth and I keep referring to that reference photograph every few seconds as well just to make sure I know where these markings go because it's very easy to kind of lose your way if you don't keep looking at back and forth for that photograph then you tend to make up in your mind really and I don't want to make it up I want it to be accurate so having that photograph directly in front of you makes a big difference it really does then do the same thing on the bottom part of the beak as well notice as well this beak is quite straight isn't it so you've got to make sure it remains straight. There isn't a curve in the beak as such. It's a very straight pointed beak. And when you see these birds fly down the river, they're like little arrows with that lovely blue back. Now the bottom part of the beak, as I mentioned, is actually quite dark because of the shadow underneath there, because it's away from that source of light. So I'm going to go in here with some very creamy mixture so it goes extremely dark. And as we know, watercolour very often dries out a little bit lighter anyway, depending on how much pigment you've got mixed with that water, of course. But because it dries out a little bit lighter, once it's bone dry, and I mean really bone dry, then you can go over the top of that with a little bit more colour, or a little bit more black in my case. And you can see from that reference photograph, it's really dark, isn't it? And not quite as dark as the bottom part of the beak, but it's really dark, that top section. So I need to add some darker lines in there, but still trying to maintain a little bit of light at the same time. Also consider where the beak joins onto the face, and you want a seamless transition from the beak to the face. You don't want sort of a, like a barrier there or anything like that. You want one to blend into the other. And I can adjust that by making sure, again, there's very little paint on that brush. In fact, my size double zero brush here, at this point, has got a very small amount of paint on the tip of that. So it is virtually a dry brush. Now, I've noticed as well, the top part of the beak, as it joins onto the top part of the head, hasn't got the right shape to it. it sort of dips down a little bit, and it shouldn't do. It should be one continuous line. And gradually as the beak touches the front of the head, should just curve up just a tiny amount. So to achieve that, I just need to lift off a small amount of paint. And I do that using a stiff bristled brush. This one is by Rosemary & Co. And it's their Eradicator. It's a small version. A really useful addition to your painting kit. Then, I'm going to do something which a lot of people don't like, I know. But I do. It's the way I tend to paint. It's my way. I did it my way. Anyway, I'm going to use some watercolour white. Now, the watercolour white is very useful for really bringing out those highlights. Yes, you can lift paint off, but you can't always get it back to the white of the paper when you lift paint off. Depends, obviously, if you're using staining colours or not. Now, the white paint is really useful as long as you're very careful how you use it and, of course, how much of it you use as well for adding those extra highlights. The benefit for using opaque white is that once it's dry, 
you can then overlay that with little bits of colour in one fell swoop, one kind of fluid motion. Otherwise you will move that white on the paper and that could go all blurry, which you don't want it to do of course. Now I do have a video here on YouTube on testing out different watercolour whites. So I'll pop a link to the top right hand corner for you. We can also use white gouache if you want to as well. Anything that's white and opaque. You can use white acrylic. Mm, acrylic white is fine. Then you'll end up with a mixed media painting of course, rather than just watercolour. But the beauty about acrylic paint is that it stays put. <laughs> I've used it before in the past. And you can put a colour over the top of that. But once it's on the paper, yeah, it's on the paper. So worth bearing that in mind if you decide to use white acrylic paint instead. And I know some of my members on my Patreon channel also tend to use white ink as well. Hmm, different idea. And there's those on the market as well. So it's worth shopping around and see what you can find to use for your white highlights. Now I do like painting birds, I really do. And because of that, I'm going to show you another video in the top right hand corner of this screen on how to paint birds' feathers.